We'll begin with how can you keep yourself motivated when the only thing you are facing is rejection, dejection, and heartbreaks continuously? Not just one, not in one sphere, but in multiple spheres. So how do we keep ourselves motivated when we face rejection, dejection, and heartbreak? By remembering what our purpose is and remembering why we do things. If the reason that we do anything is due to some expectation of what we're going to get in response from it, we are setting ourselves up for heartbreak. This is, this is the message that Lord Krishna emphasizes so deeply and in so many different ways in the Bhagavad Gita that if you are attached to the fruits of your labor, if you are attached to what comes out of what you've done, you're setting yourself up for misery. The only thing we have control over is ourselves. And so if I'm unable to be motivated because what I'm facing is rejection, the question isn't super specific, but let's say I'm applying for jobs. I apply to 50 jobs, I get rejected. Let's say I'm an author. I write 50 articles or 50 stories or even 50 books or 50 poems. I send them to be published, I get 50 rejection letters. I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an actress. I make 50 videos of myself singing or dancing or acting. I send them off to agents and managers and whatnot. 50 of 50 are rejected. Well, if the reason that I'm writing or if the reason that I'm singing or if the reason that I'm dancing or if the reason that I'm painting or if the reason I'm doing any of these things is because someone is going to read it or see it and say, oh, that's brilliant and make me a star or make me their employee or whatever it is I'm looking for. If the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is to get the job, to get the role, to get this, to get that, I've lost before I've even sent off the letter. I've lost before I've even sent off the cassette. I've lost before I've even walked in for the interview. Because what I've done is I've put my value my worth, my life, my happiness in someone else's hands. Now, that's not to say that people don't need to make a living. And if you've got to put food on the table and you've been rejected from 50 of the 50 job interviews you've gone on, that you're not going to recognize a problem. But the problem there is not a problem in you, but it's clearly a problem in the types of jobs you're applying for. Or it's clearly a problem in the way you are applying for the jobs. But this is not something that should demotivate us. We're not living, and this is so important, we're not living for other people's approval and value. And if we are, then we're going to live in misery. Because if they value us, if what we got was not rejection, but what we got was appreciation, well, coupled with that appreciation comes always anxiety about getting it again. One story got published, one poem got published, I got hired for this. 
oh my God, what if, what if I can't do it again? Now they expect this of me. Now they expect that of me. I'm not up to it. So even if we're, if we're succeeding on that level, we're failing ourselves inside. Because what I've done is I've made my value and my worth contingent upon someone else's perception. And this is where, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna makes it so clear. Do not be attached to those fruits. Whether the fruits are what someone else says, whether they accept it, whether they reject it, whether they love it, whether they hate it, whether the fruit is something as literal as the fruit of a tree growing. You can plant the seed. You can shine the sun on it. You can water it. But there's a hundred other factors that have nothing to do with you that could come into play ensuring that that seed never sprouts. None of which is your fault. None of which makes you an unworthy person. But that are out of your control. An example about this that I've shared before is, which I I love it though, it's a personal, personal example of this, literal gardening. When I was living in San Francisco, we had moved to San Francisco from the... Uh, Palo Alto area. And in Palo Alto, we had had a proper backyard with, you know, proper trees and proper dirt and proper plants and stuff. And in San Francisco, in an apartment, we just had little potted plants that you could put on a windowsill outside the kitchen window. And I love to cook. And I was a staunch vegetarian from the time I was a teenager. And so I had learned how to cook. And I loved to grow cooking herbs outside my window. First I grew them in the backyard in Palo Alto and then outside my window in San Francisco. And move to the city, plant them. They don't grow. They don't even sprout. Not one of the three pots. I thought, that's weird. God, maybe the seeds were bad. I replanted them. I get nothing. Cannot even get a sprout. And even on something as as seemingly insignificant as being able to get basil to sprout, nonetheless, it starts to sting at the ego. You're like, my God, I can't even do this? And especially when you're young, when you're insecure, you're you know finding your way in life, little, little things like that even have really a sting on the sense of self. So I'm starting to feel miserable. I've now on my, on my third batch of seeds, nothing is growing. I see my neighbors, they're growing, so it's not the weather. First I blamed the weather. San Francisco's cold, it's foggy. Neighbors' basil's growing, my basil's not growing. One day I come home early from my PhD program where I was in school. Come home early and we had adopted a cat when we moved to the city. And it was an indoor and outdoor cat, both. And I come home early. Usually I came home only in the evening. It was dark. But I came home early, middle of the day. And when I go in the kitchen to make some coffee, I look out the window and I see the cat in the pots of plants doing this. In the dirt. Now, you tell me. Regardless of how good the seeds are, regardless of how good the dirt is, how much sun, how much rain, if you've got a cat digging up the seeds you plant and throwing them all over the ground, obviously they're not going to sprout. Obviously you're never going to be able to grow anything. The reason I love this story is it so obviously had nothing to do with my value as a person so obviously had nothing to do with my worth as a person or even my value as a gardener or a cook and everything to do with this extra variable of the cat. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with the seeds, nothing to do with anything except a cat. But if I hadn't come home from school mid-afternoon early, 
this thing was really starting to affect my ego. I mean, like you fail at something. And again, I've, I've chosen a, an insignificant story because even little, little things have the power to impact us so deeply. You fail at something, even something that insignificant, enough times in a row, and it really starts to erode your sense of self. And this is where the Bhagavad Gita and so many other scriptures are, are scriptures that don't require you to be a Hindu, are scriptures that don't require you to be Indian, are scriptures that don't require you to worship God in the name of Lord Krishna, but that are so universal because all of us, I mean, at 21, 22, I wasn't, I wasn't religious at all, let alone, I, mean, I, I didn't even know who Lord Krishna was. But how valuable his teaching would have been for me if only I had had the benefit of having it in my life, which I didn't, and therefore had to wait until I showed up home from school early one day and discovered the cat and was finally able to feel okay about my gardening skills. But the same is true in bigger things. There's always another variable. It's not always a cat. But there's always another variable. And so no matter how many times you get rejected, we must never lose our motivation because actually the two things are not connected. And this is one of the most deep and important, I think, lessons of Yes, a spiritual life, but even just a general life. If even just your goal is to be happy or your goal is to be peaceful or your goal is to be productive or creative or in love, we do what we do, not because it's going to make someone else happy, but we do what we do because we've been put on earth with creativity, with skills, with abilities, with initiative, with compassion. And so we use those to act. And whether our acts are loved and accepted and revered and valued and purchased by others or whether they're not, shouldn't impact our motivation for doing them. A flower gives fragrance regardless of whether anyone bends down to smell it. You never, ever, ever see a rose bush that finally decides, forget it, like why bother giving fragrance? No one ever stops. No one ever looks anymore. Everybody's on their smartphones all the time. I'm like, I could be a pineapple tree for all anyone walking by me would notice. So forget it. I'm just going to, I'm going to stop. Why, why use that energy to give fragrance? But she keeps giving fragrance. All of nature does what it does. This is when we talk about Dharma. We do what we do because it's our duty, because it's our dharma, because it's who we are, because we love it. And of course, I'm giving lots of different options because the things that we do, we do for different reasons. Some we do because we love it. You may write, you may paint, you may draw, you may sing, you may play a sport, you may dance even though you don't have enough talent to actually ever be hired to do it or to actually ever make a record or to actually have anybody ever, you know, buy it from you or want to hire you for it, but you do it because you love to do it. Or you may do things because they're your duty to do them. You've got a family to feed. Therefore, you pump gas or you wait on tables in a restaurant or you file papers, or you do whatever, whatever people do. 
based on whatever they can do to make enough money to put food on the table. I don't know anyone who loves pumping gas or who loves waiting tables or loves filing papers, but they love their family. And the love of the family motivates them to pump gas, to wait tables, to file papers, to do whatever it is that they need to do that they wouldn't necessarily do otherwise because there's a higher goal involved. So the motivation has to come from something other than how is the world going to respond? Whether it's the general world, like I've put something out there on Facebook or on YouTube or in some public domain and I'm waiting, you know, for lots of people to love it. Or I'm waiting for one person to love it. I've written a poem to one person I love and I'm hoping it's going to make, you know, him or her love me back. Whether it's the world or one person, either way. If the motivation to do it is what those people are going to respond then we're always setting ourselves up to be miserable. Because eventually they're not going to respond the way we want them to. And then it's going to sting. Because then it's going to feel like, I did something I didn't want to do just for you, and you didn't respond. Or I'm doing something that I may love to do, but even more than my loving of doing it is my loving of how, you know, of how you're going to all respond. I may love to sing, but I'm really attached to selling that record. My loving of singing is not enough. I need to find a record label. And until and unless I find a record label, I'm not able to enjoy the singing because the singing becomes a means to an end. And that's where the problem comes in. And this is where it's so important that our motivations become, it's my duty. So if you've got a job, you do what your boss tells you to do. Whether it's fun, whether they appreciate it or not, because at the end of the day, you're, you're walking home with a paycheck that's feeding your family. Or you find another job. That's duty. Or you do it because it's your dharma. And again, the dharma is not necessarily sometimes the thing that you're doing. Your dharma may be to serve. You know, it's like the story that I tell all the time about the saint and the scorpion. So the saint is saving the scorpion time and time again from the water. Even though the scorpion keeps stinging him, Because his dharma is to save. Well, his dharma is not to be stung. And the saint certainly could wonder, you know, my dharma is to to save. How come I'm always getting stung? But if you look at it deeply, what you'll realize is the two things don't actually have anything to do with each other. The dharma to save, in that case of the saint, follows him wherever he goes. In that moment, it happened to happen in a river with a scorpion that stung him. But it also happened perhaps downriver with someone he helped across the river. Maybe it happened in the village where he took his breakfast to where he's going to take his dinner, in the family where he was begging for food, and when they brought him in for food, he said something or shared something or gave something or taught something or gave a blessing that helped the family. So, so he's moving through the world fulfilling that dharma. Sometimes it feels fulfilling. Gave a blessing, gave advice, gave healing to a family who touched his feet before he left. And sometimes it stings, literally. Like when it's the scorpion you're trying to save. So it's not, it's not that the dharma is wrong or that the dharma is about getting stung or the dharma is about getting walked all over or that somehow maybe this isn't my dharma because look, I'm getting stung all the time. 
How could this be my dharma if I've got welts all over my hand? But this is where it's important to understand that more, more deeply. If our dharma is to serve, or to save, or to give, or to love, well, sometimes the people we are serving, saving, loving, giving to, are going to love us in return. Sometimes they're going to hug us, sometimes they're going to kiss us, sometimes they're going to touch our feet, sometimes they're going to give us a bonus and a promotion, sometimes they're going to you know, do all sorts of things for us. Sometimes they'll ignore us, sometimes they'll step all over us, sometimes like the scorpion they'll sting us. But we keep doing what we do because that's our dharma. And the third, third reason, and there may be more, this is just the three that come to my mind at, at this very moment, is because we love it. It may not be our duty, may not put food on the table. It also may not necessarily be our dharma, but we love it. I love photography. Love to take pictures. Used to do lots of it, don't do very much of it these days, but, but I love it. And there'll be times I'll find myself, you know, with a camera in hand, just taking pictures of all sorts of things. And somebody will wonder, well, why are you taking, like, why that? And like, what are you going to do with that picture? You know, because usually the pictures we take are pictures that go somewhere and there's some, some benefit to them. They're going to go in a brochure. They're going to go on the website. They're going to, you know, they're going to be used in some way. But the photography that I always did that I loved was just shapes and lights and, you know, you do it and you think, well, where, what are you going to do with that? Where is that going to go? Well, probably nowhere. But there's, but there's a joy in just doing something you love. But again, if I, were, if I had my motivation of, well, you know, I'm going to post these on Facebook and, you know, the guy from the Met in New York is going to hunt down my email address and, you know, email me and say, oh, my God, we have to have a show of your photographs. And then every day I'd be going on Facebook wondering, like, where's the guy from the Met and why hasn't he contacted me yet? And suddenly all of the joy of doing it would dissipate. Why, you know, why is a picture of, of some random person getting so many more likes than this picture that I thought was so beautiful? See, you get the ego all wrapped up in it. And you've brought it misery into something that should have just brought joy. And so we do what we do again. Our motivation, circling back to the specific question, our motivation is not that we're going to be rewarded, accepted, loved, praised for what we do. Our motivation is in the doing of it. The doing of it is its own reward, whether because it's our duty, whether because it's our dharma, or whether we, because we actually love whatever it is we're doing. But none of those three has anything to do with how the world responds to it. So yeah, sometimes there's rejection and dejection. Sometimes there's praise. But this again is what Lord Krishna reminds us, is that a yogi, a yogi, a wise one, a spiritual one, is one who is neither lifted up too high in praise and success, nor one who is brought down in failure. A yogi is one who is not affected, not raised and lowered like the waves on the ocean by wealth and poverty, pleasure and pain, success and failure. And so as we move in our spiritual 
world? The answer to that is not I don't do anything. It's I keep doing. But I do for reasons other than to get that high of the praise, of the reward, of the love. Because if I love the highs, the lows are going to come. Ask any surfer. Every wave you ride going up, it's going to come down. And if you don't know how to properly ride, you're going to go splat on the beach. And so if we're, if we're hooked into the waves that go up, inevitably we're going to find ourselves drowning in the waves that come down.